A literature review by Fuji looked at discogenic low back pain, which is essentially low back pain that is originating from the intervertebral discs. And to begin with, they looked at the different categories of low back pain, where they agreed with a previous systematic review on the diagnosis for low back pain, where there's three different categories. We have nociceptive, neuropathic, and then sensitization. And what they concluded was that discogenic pain is really a combination of nociceptive and neurogenic. While disc issues are commonly diagnosed as the reason for low back pain, the way that we diagnose these conditions isn't actually very effective. And currently there's actually no standard that's agreed upon for the diagnosis of discogenic low back pain. The best way that we actually have to effectively determine if the disc is the origin of pain is through discography. However, that uh, procedure is invasive and actually can accelerate the degenerative changes in the disc. And so it's not feasible to do that in clinical practice. The article recommended several non-invasive diagnostic tools that we can use to diagnose discogenic low back pain. The first, which is pretty much standard with everything, is a clinical exam and a history. They found that centralized low back pain was sensitive to discogenic low back pain, which essentially means that if it's negative, we can rule out the disc as a potential cause of low back pain. However, it lacks specificity, which means that if we have a positive result, meaning that we have pain in the centralized area of the low back, that we can actually say that it's the disc for sure. The study also recommended several serum markers that might help with the diagnosis. CC lichen 5, CXC lichen 6, interleukin 6, and high sensitivity uh, C-reactive protein were a couple of the various markers that we can use. All of these obviously would require a, a blood workup to be able to diagnose this. The study also suggested that MRI is helpful in diagnosing these conditions. And one area in particular that they looked at was what's called the high intensity zone, which is the posterior aspect of the disc, so it would be back through here. And essentially we'd be looking for a high intensity signal that's separate than the nucleus pulposus. And if we had that high intensity signal on that posterior aspect of the disc, that actually correlates to annulus damage and increased pain. On MRI, we could also see if there's modic changes, and a modic change is at the end plate, which is the top part or the bottom part of the vertebral body, and what we'd be looking for on MRI is a hypo-intense signal on a T1-weighted MRI and a hyper-intense signal on a T2-weighted MRI. And if we have this, this is called a type 1 modic change, and that is actually highly associated with intervertebral degeneration and back pain. Then for treatment approaches, the study broke down the treatment approaches into three different categories. There were invasive approaches, semi-invasive approaches, and then conservative approaches. Spinal fusion was the invasive approach for discogenic pain. And the problem with spinal fusions is that one, they're very invasive, which also means that there's a high risk of complications after the surgery. But then also one of the problems is that when you fuse one area, the motion goes somewhere else, which means that uh, adjacent to where the fusion is, you're going to actually speed up the rate of degeneration at that segment. And so while you fix one area by fusing it, you're actually causing a problem in another area. There were a couple of semi-invasive procedures that were also mentioned in the article. One was intradiscal electrothermal therapy, and this procedure has actually been completely abandoned for discogenic low back pain. The other was electrostimulation, and this therapy has actually not been shown to be very effective, and it's got a high risk of adverse events occurring after it. The only reason why I think it's worthwhile mentioning these two procedures is that neither of them are actually recommended for discogenic low back pain. And so if somebody is recommending them, I think it's worthwhile to look at the research and say they're actually not worthwhile to have. The other semi-invasive procedure was injections. And one of the interesting things about injections is that they're actually pretty common for the treatment of low back pain, especially with radicular symptoms. But when we look at the research for discogenic low back pain, uh, these injections actually don't have um, well-known efficacy long-term. And so for a procedure that's done so frequently, we actually don't know how effective they are in the long-term. 
And then finally, for non-invasive procedures, there were a lot that were listed. So traction therapy and then McKenzie, which is an extension-based protocol. Uh, funny enough, even though they're pretty common for discogenic low back pain, they actually have limited evidence on their effectiveness. The one with the best evidence is actually cognitive behavioral therapy, where it's taking a multi-pronged um, approach, so really looking at the biopsycho and social aspects that can contribute to low back pain. That is actually the most effective. And then actually they also recommend acupuncture and dry needling, which a systematic review has shown that they've been effective for both pain relief and for uh, improvement in function. However, both acupuncture and dry needling have not been shown to be more effective than any of the other therapies. The thing that's most striking about this article is that while discogenic low back pain is frequently diagnosed as a cause of low back pain, we actually don't have a good way of diagnosing it. And so while some of the symptoms might suggest uh, disc-related uh, pain, we're not really sure. And like, that, like I was mentioning in my other videos on low back pain, that's problematic because if we don't know the actual cause of the low back pain, it's very hard to find an effective strategy to treat it. But then when we look at the treatment options, it makes a lot of sense in the way that we actually approach these from a non-invasive to more invasive in that if we actually don't know the cause or the specific cause of low back pain, it doesn't make sense to specifically target the disc. So to do a spinal fusion, to do um, any of the injections or anything like that because we actually don't even know if it's the disc that's causing the pain in the first place. And so it makes more sense that if we have an effective treatment option that's conservative, whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy, spinal manipulation, acupuncture, exercise, all of those things, we should do those first and see if we can help both decrease the pain and then improve function, which other research has shown that they are as effective as some surgical approaches and that they're actually recommended as the primary treatment options in a lot of the um, clinical practice guidelines for low back pain. 